Hey guys, you'll never guess where we are. <laughs> That's right, we're still in Wyoming and we're showing you what Casper, Wyoming has to offer. I'm Jamie. I'm Linda. And this is Roaming with Rosie. Everything seems bigger in Wyoming. Maybe it's the open, uncrowded space. Maybe it's the mountain peaks. Casper used to be the biggest city in Wyoming, but now Cheyenne is. But they'll keep up the appearance of big things any way they can. They have big oil, big mountains, and big fluffy cows. And while some cities have pigeons, Casper has flocks of big birds. No, not that one. Wild turkeys which is why it just makes sense to find Sanford's Grub and Pub there, the epitome of all things big. Okay guys, this is insane. This is the craziest, quirkiest place we have ever seen. On top of that, food portions are humongous and the food is really good and it's crazy. They've mixed everything with everything and fried things. It's kind of like a carnival and a circus and a gourmet restaurant all in one. But if you're in Wyoming off the I-25, you gotta stop over here. It's insane. Sanford's Grub and Pub, don't forget it. Not me. Thanks. <laughs> Holy crap, what is that? That's a chicken fried steak. Is that the biggest chicken fried steak you've ever seen? Yes. That, that's like half a chicken. And that was your side salad that's all you can eat. Mm -hmm. You're pretty sure you're not gonna eat more. And mine is, I forget which salad. I don't know what that stuff is. That stuff is cinnamon sugar butter to go with the delectable bread rolls. Jamie's dinner came with all you can eat salad and we both had ice cream with choice of toppings. They even have a burger called the OMG. No, we didn't order that. So the next day we had to get some hiking in to burn some of those calories. And we found yet another quirky and weird place to do that, deep in the forest at the top of Mount Casper. Where? Oh, oh yeah, I see, I see. There's a deer. I don't know if I captured him with a camera. He seems to be staying a distance away from us, but every, corner, every turn we make, he's standing there and then he trots off a little further. It's like a magical deer. <laughs> I don't know if I captured him or not on camera, but he's watching us. In 1928, artist Neil Forsling and her two young daughters homesteaded over 600 acres up here on top of Mount Casper. Without any books of their own, she made up a magical world of the seven good but mischievous witches and other characters that inhabited this land she named Crimson Dawn. 
The legend of Crimson Dawn Park is a strange place, especially if you've never heard of the book before stumbling onto it. The Crimson Dawn Association and the Parks Department, who Forsling donated her property and cabins to, have kept her stories alive up here. For nearly 40 years, the author herself led friends along these paths in the dark, with lanterns telling her stories, and the tradition continues on inscribed tablets at creative shrines throughout the trail. This trail is pretty well marked except for one point where it splits between going to the theater, which we haven't yet seen, and getting back on this trail. So that was the only point we lost it. What have we here? Tin Owl. Obviously. The Lavender Witch. Now we're finding there's a glitter trail. See the little stars? It's all glittery stars here. And this is the shrine to Star Witch. The homesick sea witch, Undine. These legends and stories Forsling told here on her mountain were published in 1980. The book is called Crimson Dawn, the story of the Casper Mountain Witches. In 1973, she donated her cabins and land to be used as a public park and a mountain museum. To this day, each year on June 21st, the summer solstice, there is a Midsummer's Eve festival complete with the seven witches and other costume characters and storytellers, followed by a midsummer bonfire. Everyone is welcome and you can even get married up here. The World Class National Historic Trails Interpretive Center is a perfect place to not only learn about the half million mostly European immigrants who came through here, but also to experience some of what that might have been like. And we meet our first landmark that we already visited in Nebraska, to Nira. This trip has taken us through Nebraska, South Dakota, and part of Wyoming at this point. And we had already learned so much about America's early pioneers headed west along the Oregon, California, Bozeman, and Mormon trails. Casper is where those trails begin to fork away for more specific destinations. But first, they had to get across the North Platte River located here. Attention visitors, we will be showing our picture film footsteps to the west immediately in the center of the building in our theater. If you would like to watch our award-winning film footsteps to the west, please make your way to the theater at this time. Our road was uniformly the same thing every day, passing across wide, dreary wastes covered only with sage and green. If you'd been here 150 years ago, on this very hill, looking down on the wide, muddy North Platte River, you could have watched the pioneers pass with their wagons and animals. In what was to become the largest unforced migration in the history of the world. But whatever their final destination, their paths converged here, in what is now known as Casper, for the final crossing of the North Platte River. In this free museum, we heard and saw many stories of those who dared to make this journey. Everything from how they measured miles to feeling what it was like to ride in a wagon or pulling a cart loaded with supplies. Did you carry that for 2,000 miles? Yeah without shoes that are comfortable. Sure. Fort Casper was there to protect safe passage through here when it came to Native Americans objecting to this settlement of their lands. But the pioneers also had to cross the North Platte River. The weather and the river were unpredictable. Is this thing moving or is it completely oh, our man. eyes? Pardon me. May I move these mail bags? I feel like it's moving. There's simply no room for my feet.
the names on this wall are replicas of what we're about to find on Independence Rock, just 50 miles west of here. After the museum, we headed out to view some of those Platte River crossing points. Today we went to the Trails West Interpretive Museum and um, learned so much more about the people who went this way by wagon to find the West, both the Oregon, all of the Oregon Trail, California Trail, the Mormon Trail, Pony Express, people heading out for Gold Rush, and um, it all came through this area. So if you watched our earlier videos on Scott's Bluff and Chimney Rock, those were landmarks in Nebraska as they were also heading West. This is where they get off of the North Platte River and they start to head on to other rivers and divide up in different directions depending on where they're going. So we've stopped at Bessemer Bend and this was one of the last crossings of the North Platte River and they've got this really cool interpretive trail here kind of in the middle of nowhere. And of course all of this was the middle of nowhere for those pioneers. So they've got all these stations here. You can walk along and learn even more about what happened in the past. Next stop on this day's itinerary, Independence Rock. We had been learning about this landmark since our visit to Scott's Bluff National Monument in Nebraska last month at the beginning of our trip. Back then, we knew very little about the half million people who went west in the 1800s to find opportunity, strike it rich with gold, or find religious freedom that this side of the new nation promised them. Since setting foot in the Nebraska Panhandle, then traveling through South Dakota's Black Hills, and now through Eastern Wyoming, we've experienced an in-person perspective and education of the historic battles fought over land rights and gold, and the lives lost in towns built along the way with what was in the 1800s a new American spirit. At Independence Rock, we're about to see, in their own words, the pioneers' emotions of making it this far. So that is Independence Rock. And there are 50,000 names carved into it of people who took these trails west. Beautiful area, totally different looking than Casper. We've only driven out about 50 miles from Casper, going west. And this is another point at which people parted company, people they'd been traveling with, and now headed off in different directions. For the Mormons, they were three quarters of the way, but for people going to Oregon, they were only a third of the way on their travel. In just about 30 years, Half a million people crossed through here, the bulk of them in a very short period of that. 50,000 of them put their names on this rock. We stayed at Dismet Lake, Lake Dismet up in Buffalo. John Pierre Dismet, he called this the Great Register because people put where they were from, they put their dates, sometimes they put more information than that. There's lichen growing on the rocks now, which covers up some of it, but we're gonna see what we can on this walk around Independence Rock. I didn't realize it was this big. Wow, look at this. 1890. These people came out here, they walked, their wagons carried food for many, many months, equipment they would need when they got there, medicines, clothes, and I'm worried whether I got the right hiking shoes on today. So these people walked. They let, little ones maybe were in the wagon, but everyone else walked across the nation through water, through snow, through whatever, hopefully not much snow. So the whole point of why this is called Independence Rock is they knew if they'd made it here by Independence Day, 4th of July, that they would be able to get to their destinations before snow, before winter set on. So 
they had to leave in late spring while it was still cold and there was a lot of dangerous thunderstorms across the plains. But at least if they made it this far, they knew they would be able to get where they were going without dealing with winter. We've got air conditioning in the car. So I tried to go up. It is just too vertical right in here. Way too vertical. But I wonder if that's why you can see names here because people have walked on it enough to keep the growth off of it. Uh, take pictures. In 1852 alone, an estimated 50,000 pioneers passed this rock on their way on their way west. Dexter could do it, but it's too steep for me. It's amazing to think that a half a million people passed through here during such a short period. They camped here and then they said goodbye to trail mates headed to different points west. June 29th, 1849. It's a nice sitting area that they've provided so that you could sit and contemplate what it may have felt like to make it to here because so many didn't so many left their loved ones buried along the trail ezra meeker 21 years old came with his wife and their infant and they arrived came past through here in 1852 and they arrived in washington territory puget sound in october of 1852 there was a big snake here, but it went that way really fast in the grass. Oh, okay. So, it was trying to get away from us. It didn't look like a rattler, but I'm not sure what they look like here. Look at him traversing, how cute. Good job, Dexter. Yeah, it's like you're, you're skiing. Our last stop for the day was five miles west of Independence Rock. This is the Devil's Gate interpretive site. It was written about in many diaries. Some immigrants chose to walk or wade through this 1,500 foot long, 50 foot wide gorge on the Sweetwater River while their wagons followed the trail to the east. There's a walking path here with interpretive signage along the way. Our campsite in Casper was the Fort Casper Campground, which is adjacent to the Fort Casper Museum, although they're not connected operations. The campground is clean and has facilities for those traveling through or for more permanent residents. It's basically a parking space with hookups, but they do have a bathhouse, playground, laundry, and nice picnic areas. From the campground, you can walk out onto several trails that lead to the North Platte River Walk. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this visit to Casper, Wyoming, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as it really helps make a difference for this channel. And come back for next week's episode where we'll be checking out a bit of Laramie, Wyoming, where we camped at nearby Kurt Gowdy State Park. Our campsite offered amazing views of the lake, and we found some great hiking trails there. We've put links in this video's description for more information about all the places shown in this episode. There's also links for products and services we use and recommend. And when you come back and use those links, we may get a small commission, and it's a great way at no additional cost to you to support Roaming with Rosie. Right now, if you haven't already, we'd love if you'd click that subscribe button in the corner of this video. And do click that bell so you'll be notified when we upload that new episode. As always, we would love to hear from you, so leave a comment so you can be part of the conversation. Until next time, see ya!